So the two authors of the Kademlia paper have written at least one other paper on distributed hash tables or distributed hash table like things. The Kademlia paper went on to become the DHT used in so many peer to peer applications. Today, I'd like to explore that we might have been building on the wrong paper the whole time. The one in question is Sloppy Hashing and Self-Organizing Clusters by Michael J. Friedman and David Mazieres. Uh, it's really neat. It's a really neat paper. Uh, and I think that if you have spent, DHTs have emerged a, as a very popular way of working in peer-to-peer -peer systems, of actually building a functioning thing in peer-to-peer -peer systems. And Kademlia in particular has emerged, uh, at least in a lot of the places that we work, uh, in particular IPFS, as a sort of tried and true way of moving around data, uh, in particular provider data. And the way that the IPFS network uses uh, the DHT is to route content and to say who, which peers have what stuff and give you a mechanism to discover that. There are some things to talk about, but let's start. So core of the paper sort of intro introduces with two main points. The first is that DHTs provide the wrong abstraction for broader internet adoption. And by broader internet adoption, uh, the project that they're building this around is called Coral and Coral CDN. I have no idea what happened to this project, but I know it did achieve a lot of use and uh, it was never open sourced. So there's that. And I think the nice sort of like way to summarize this is just DHTs are read optimized, right? And they're optimized for this notion that you have, uh, you're not going to do a lot of writing and you're not going to do a lot of mutation and you're certainly not going to store a ton of uh, records about the same thing, which is exactly what we're doing in IPFS, right? We have numerous providers of a single thing and we're doing a fine provider, gathering up records, dialing those addresses and fetching the content. And that's churning at a really high rate. And so the first thing they want to address is this like wrong abstraction. The thing that's interesting here is the actual abstraction. The abstraction doesn't really change. It still behaves like a hash table in the get and put values, but the sloppiness is where the guarantees really change. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. The next thing they talk about is that the one that really drives me nuts, which is DHTs have poor locality. This is a basic problem that we'll talk about more in detail, but the problem, the sort of general way that DHTs function is by structuring themselves as an overlay network. They largely ignore the physical topology of the network. And we have been running into major league problems, figuring out how to move content around fast, because you can run into situations where you use a DHT and end up needing to dial halfway around the world to find out that the content that you need is next door. That's what they mean by poor locality. Both of those things are very real, very immediate pain points that we struggle with when trying to employ a DHT for CDN-like use cases. This paper has some solutions for them, and it's from 2002. Okay, so uh, again, it achieves read-write balance through sloppiness. We're going to talk about sloppiness. Um, at the highest level, sloppiness is just, you're just going to get some values back. I think it would be similar to the way that we use the phrase gossip nowadays in modern sort of like peer-to-peer -peer systems development. You're going to ask for a value and you're going to get something back. It will, there are zero guarantees and actually almost no guarantee that that the thing you get back will be the total set or that you're getting anything like meaningfully use or you're getting something useful, but you're getting something faster than more than you're getting something accurate. So if the whole DHT could possibly know about five values for a given key, you might get one of them. You might get three of them. That's the, where the sloppiness comes in. Depending on where you are in the network, you will see different things. And then it achieves locality through clustering, which is a really interesting technique. And I think is the, actually the, the more interesting part of this. Uh, the sloppiness is really cool, but the end is necessary to get to where this uh, design wants to go. But the clustering is the bit that I think is really interesting. So just to start, we can use a, a like basic network. Uh, some of this is a little bit hard to read, but I wanted to use like a simple drawing, <laughs> simple, I don't know, whatever. Uh, we have a network and it includes all of the physical stuff. Just to quickly go through what this is, we have uh, each of these I've just gone through and lettered each one uh, so that we can actually see what they are. And these are just like labels. Normally they wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to actually do this in a physical network. 
And then in the purple, we have a binary representation of a randomly chosen identifier for each node. And so these nodes pick them, pick these at random. This is the equivalent of your public key if you're used to peer-to-peer -peer systems. Uh, the we're using IPv6 in this simulation because it's a simulation, and we get to pretend that IPv6 is everywhere and NATs aren't a thing. Cool. Uh, and that's why routers, including your home router and the fancy backbone routers, all have IPv6 addresses. And then these little millisecond labels are round trip times. This is not uh, latency. And for the sake of this, I've just made these bi-directional. In the real world, you could have different uh, millisecond latencies in either direction, whatever, who cares? Uh, and just as like a final note, the link between these two backbone routers is kind of the slowest thing in the whole network. It's at 100 milliseconds. This is simulating uh, a large distance between these two uh, routers. Cool. Um, let's talk about the classic Kademlia DHT. Uh, in this world, we now have our node IDs, so everybody's picked their spot. They're all mapped into a space. Uh, and so let's, we have two things that have appeared new in this diagram. We have a key that is going to be stored on node F because it is uh, XOR, exclusive OR distance close to this. This is part of the reason why I just listed them out uh, in binary because I've been doing a bunch of hand XORing and it makes things easier. But the value of this is burb, of course. Why not? And then this is a look at D's routing table. And so in Kademlia, routing is based on the distance of the exclusive OR. So you take your, your ID and you take the ID of someone else, you exclusive OR them, and you look at that as a number, and that gives you a value called distance. And you only store a window to distance. Uh, in proper Kademlia, there are multiple values per bucket. But you wouldn't store the value of F, B, and I because their distance from you is too high. And so you get rid of them. If you already had enough peers to begin with, it's ignoring the details. But you can see where this shows up as a problem because now when node D tries to go to find the value stored at F, so it's gonna issue a request for find value for uh, the thing for the the key zero 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 one 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 one, and so the way they would get that is you'd say find you know in user land they would say find me the value of Alice, and they would hash Alice and get zero 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 one 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 one, and because D doesn't have F in its routing table, it is going to ask the closest to that distance calculation, which is going to be G. And so D is going to send a find value message to G, which is going to go from here to the router, to this router, across the universe, down to router B, through to the G machine. The G machine is then going to respond to D with, oh, hey, yeah, 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 you want F. And it's going to turn out that F is IPv address v actually v6. Oh, I got that wrong. Um, but this whole round trip took 121 milliseconds for you to find out that you need to make a two millisecond request to computer F on your home network and respond back with burb. This is what's irritating about the overlay network, right? The, the problem being the lack of locality. Your machine doesn't do anything to prioritize the fact that the connection to machines, that D's connection to machines F and E is really fast. And so this is where clustering comes in. And so we start with classic Kademlia. And so we're going to take this in layers, but looking at this whole network through D's view, uh, we have D and then the distance to all the other nodes that it knows about. This is how Kademlia would work today. Then what we're going to do is layer on two more levels of clusters. And these are going to be determined by thresholds of round trip time. And so you will only join a cluster of level two if 90% of the nodes that you sample respond in less than 30 milliseconds. And so if you, I, uh, however you uncover, for, forget joining and leaving networks too much for right now, but the point being when you encounter nodes in a cluster and you aren't in a cluster and you sample that cluster and you get back responses that are less than 30 milliseconds, you join that cluster. And then you do the same thing for another threshold lower, which is at 100 milliseconds for cluster level one. Uh, they're, despite being higher on the page, they are lower because they're lower in terms of round trip time. And so it's a lower level. 
Lower levels are going to be sparser, right? Because they're closer to you, that means, and there will be fewer of them. The level zero is uh, always just the zero, um, all of zero value cluster. Uh, so the identifier is all zeros. Um, and that's the classic DHT with an infinite round trip time. So you always fall back to global. Let's just look everywhere. We need to find the data. Who cares? The thing that's cool about clustering is you use the same identifier in all clusters. And so you are node D. Well, your node identifier is going to be what? D is 00001101 or uh, I'm not going to try and do that in hex. But you are node D always. And you are nodes and C is node C always, no matter what cluster they're in. Which means that when you make routing requests from one cluster to or inside of one cluster, you can seamlessly drop down into another cluster. And this is what's exciting. The response of F is still useful, even if F sends you off a cliff to go talk to G. And that uh, sort of be ability to prioritize nodes that are close to you because you know that you're going to be able to speak with them far more quickly and then fall back to progressively slower things gives you the locality uh, characteristic that we really want. Why three? Uh, you, there's lots of reasons for this and why the 30 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds, uh, reasons for that too. These are tunable numbers. Uh, you could, there's no reason you can't have uh, multiple levels. The more levels that you have, uh, the more requests you're gonna end up firing generally. And so you kind of want to be a little bit careful about this. And uh, yeah, there's more to it, but they sort of run with this baseline of three levels. Now, when we, we can sort of go back to our network and start drawing some clustering diagrams from the perspective of node D uh, in this case. And so D's routing table is gonna change. It's now, this is just, let's pretend that D has found um, their clusters. They are in all the right places. I'm not gonna worry about joining and leaving clusters quite yet, but they are self-organizing. The cluster level one, level two, which is uh, its lowest level and closest cluster is gonna have nodes E and F. Hey, look at that, nodes E and F, close. Nodes, one millisecond RTT time, really, well, two millisecond RTT time to F, one to E. Really, really fast, right? And so now, uh, that's great. It's always gonna issue all requests to this cluster first. And then you can see where this, uh, and then we also have this verticality where cluster level one includes everything from level two and the things that sit on side, uh, just underneath this 30 millisecond threshold. So, so node C is included in this cluster level two. And then cluster level zero, or cluster level one, sorry. Level zero is the full everybody and will span the ocean. And so in its writing table, it will start here but replies can drop down really quickly. And so we can see how when we do that same find value from the classic Ademlia, instead of going out to node G this time, we prioritize the lookup to load to key F, despite the fact that their distance from us is very high. We're not worried about that, right? We'll, we'll keep them anyways, because they are closer in terms of round tip time threshold. Uh, so the request goes out and we go, hey, find this and we just come back with bird. This is good. This is a nice thing. I like this a lot. Let's talk about sloppiness. Where sloppiness comes into play is, uh, it's, it's very odd to me. This strikes me as exactly the way that it should work in the first place. I guess I've been spending too much time dealing in gossipy stuff, but uh, basically you can store multiple different values for the same key at different places in the network. And depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer. So if node B asks node A for this the value of this key, they're going to get banana, but they might get Snoopy, and they might get Apple, and they might get Burb. And at first, that sounds really bad and weird. But like, if you think about um, two things, uh, Coral was or is uh, doing the right thing, which is or not the right thing. Coral is doing exactly what IPFS does. The provider of a CID is stored in the DHT. The actual fetching of content is somewhere else. And so effectively, all these things are, are pointers, right? And so instead of banana, apple, Snoopy, you're gonna, hey, you're gonna get 
the peer ID that you need to go get the content from. And so all the DHT's main job is to route you to the place where you can start the process of transfer. And the paper goes to say you only need one peer with uh, a meaningful replica of the content that you're after to get started, right? And so the whole game is just how fast can we find you up here with that content? I think that that should be relaxed uh, to say all you need is all you need to start with is one peer, and there's no reason that you can't continue the search and stream the results as they're coming in, uh, which is just like a simple design optimization. Not a simple, but a design optimization that should happen. Basically, that's to say there's no reason that you can't continue to traverse the network and find Apple, Banana, Snoopy, all these other values. And so this is where it just sort of makes sense. The network is sloppy in the sense that if you design the algorithm to just halt upon a first result, you're not going to get any guarantees that it will be the one true result. But the more we talk about decentralized and distributed systems, like this local knowledge first paradigm is starting to hit our heads more and more. This doesn't strike me as this like strange thing. Uh, it's just like, look, this whole network is just hints about where to find content. We just need to get you those hints as fast as we can. Cool. So sloppiness neat. It doesn't blow my mind. Um, cluster self-organization. Uh, I'm going to do a giant hand wave here, but the paper goes into details about how clusters can be made self-organizing. I'm going to cover some small details that I think are interesting and crucial to like kind of understand how it works. But there are some caveats here. The biggest of which is this whole system relies on network size estimation. Uh, Dennis Troutwin from uh, Probe Lab team has done some great network size estimation work with the Kademlia DHT uh, that has real numbers behind it. I would like to check in on those figures. Um, and so I'm not too worried about cluster uh, or about network size estimation, um, but it's worth noting because you need that for the merging side of things. Uh, the way that discovery works is really cool. Uh, look at this first. Uh, basically the way it works, I've, I've kind of, the one thing about the paper is it doesn't actually go into uh, granular detail about the protocol. It just sort of describes how the whole thing hangs together and doesn't get into the actual message format description the way the Kademlia paper does. But the way that uh, you discover lower level clusters is you insert yourself into higher level clusters with um, pointers. And the pointers are, you basically, uh, if, uh, e wanted to sort of tell the world about cluster level two with this identifier. E would uh, calculate the hash of the router and store its own record as a sort of signpost that says, "Hey, <clears throat> this if you if you take this router's address and you hash it and you look it up in the DS DSHT, the distributed sloppy hash table." You might get back this record, and then if you, so you do a get value for that record, you get back the address of D. Oh, sorry, this has been D inserting itself into the, into the uh, DHT, <coughs> pardon me, DSHT. You, yeah, uh, you'll do a get value for the hash of that router. You're gonna get back the address of D. You're gonna, I just invented this message type. This isn't covered in the paper, but let's just say there's a clusters message type. And you issue that message to node D, which UDP address uh, with IPv6 address four, uh, it'll respond with, hey, these are my clusters. And that's uh, the way that it works. And so it's literally just watering holes. Like you go to the watering hole and you put a sticky note with your address on it and you say, hey, if anybody else comes to this watering hole, I'm over, I'm over there. And you do that with a trace route. Um, along along the way, and so if you trace around from here to I, you can do that with any of these and say, "Hey, I'm over here, and here are my clusters." Uh, the paper is, recommends you only do it for the first five hops on your trace route, but I don't know. The, the, why not do three? Why not do four? We'll figure it out. It's an interesting technique, uh, is the point. And so that's how discovery works. They just seed their info into the DHT itself by using the network actual physical network topology. It's kind of cool. Uh, there's an open question about like IPv4, IPv6, and I guess, you know, how do you handle this? You could just use the 6-4 combination address types or multi addresses, some format. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so the next question is like, uh, how do you merge clusters together? So uh, when you don't have a level two cluster, you just create one. And so you'll randomly invent an, an identifier and say, cool, I'm the level two cluster now. I'm, I'm, I'm the queen of this town. The, and then you may come along and someone else has at the same time declared them the queen of this town. And you try and decide who's, who's, whose town should we be in. You just, the, the point behind self-organization is one node may just elect to join the other node. And other nodes will discover that by just natural process of interacting is the idea. And this is borrowed, borrowed directly from the Gademlia paper, right? The idea that the uh, transmission of the network topology itself should just be kind of piggybacked on the messaging protocols that are communicating data. And so as you are doing hops to find values, you're discovering nodes that you're using to update your routing table. Uh, same idea applies here for the actual cluster moving. So if you want to switch clusters, you just switch clusters. And then when people ask you about what clusters in, you tell them and they can decide to move or not based on, well, then they'll go probe that cluster and say, hey, what are my round trip times to that to that cluster? And so on and so forth. Uh, splitting, I, I'm gonna be real, splitting, I'm not totally clear on yet. Um, as far as I understand, you calculate a fixed point for a cluster, which I think might just be the hash of the cluster identifier. And then you estimate the network size <coughs> and you estimate your distance to that. And if it's too big, then you try and join other clusters, I think. I don't know, lots of hand waving here. The point being, there is an approach for self-organization. If this whole broader approach seemed interesting, we would need to kind of really dig in and understand this. Um, problems with the signposting trick. Uh, this is worse than Kademlia in terms of privacy uh, for the privacy zealots out there. Uh, the fact that we're pasting our address and the route that we took to get somewhere uh, all over the, the DHC is kind of kind of not great. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I don't know what to do about that or if we do have to do anything about that, but it's worth bringing up. I think that's a it is a step backwards in terms of privacy. Uh, it does require a network size estimation, so that's a thing. I don't think that's as big a deal. This also requires a ton of latency probing and just like, hey, how long does it take for messages to slowly your, your pings and your pongs? Just the sort of basic guts work of writing the software that knows how to do the trace route and like find and record that and send and see those messages. Like there's a lot of like actual network internals built into this uh, clustering technique. Uh, the protocol isn't spelled out and so like, we have to fill in a whole bunch of details ourselves. As far as I can tell, this thing sort of also ran into this really sort of very real problem of not being very Byzantine fault tolerant, right? The idea that you could forge records in here, or do weird stuff. As we've seen uh, with regular DHTs, if you're using content address data and uh, you're signing the records that you're posting and all the records are gossipy, all of this is super gossipy to begin with. So like, I don't know, personally, my read on this is that the expectations around fault tolerance should be taken with a grain of salt. We're looking for a system to quickly identify people to dial to ask if they have the stuff that we need. Uh, I, I think that's a great place to stop. So I wouldn't worry too much about Byzantine fault tolerance. I, I mean, we have to worry about it, but like, I don't think that we need to fully expect that of our DHT, whether sloppy or otherwise. Um, that kind of covers it. I think that's the the coral paper. Uh, in a nutshell, there's a lot, a lot of hand waving in there, but writing one of these would be a real pain. Uh, it would be a lot of low level. How long did it take you to respond? Timing, state management. You now need to manage clusters of routing tables and implement the and fully understand the self uh, management side of things. But oh boy, the upside you get out of having a DHT that is looks a lot more like Gossip Sub, has a lot of really nice characteristics in terms of reader writer sort of like quickness, and has this locality characteristic. I think you can see why this would be useful to us because we're already doing stuff like this in IPFS. Kubo ships with two DHTs on by default. Uh, two Kademlia DHTs, one for your local network and one for the wide area network. And so like, we're already proxying the clustering thing. The huge advantage of the clustering trick now is you actually are literally merging 
the routing information. So you would start local and slowly progress to the higher level, higher latency connections. And you would have a layer in the middle if you did the two la the three layer approach, uh, three level approach. And so I think that this approach is really, really fascinating for our line of work where it this whole approach is purposely designed for this high churn, lots of replicas coming and going. The whole thing's gonna be a hot mess. So we're just gonna kind of try and manage the chaos approach, which strikes me as far closer to the design constraints that we're working with. So I'm super excited about this. I just, I'm very concerned about the amount of work that we go into building something like this. This is a lot of engineering. Uh, so those are my thoughts.